were. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give tonight. I thank you, Lord, that anytime we give into this ministry, we know, Lord, that we're giving it into you, into your kingdom. For freedom in Christ's church belongs to you. No one man built this church. This church was built by Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that this church will stand the test of time. And so, Lord, every, every single amount of funds that come into this, this ministry, it's holy and, and it's honorable to you, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that you grant the increase back into our lives many times over. And, Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you, Father, that this word will find a home in each and every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So tonight we're going to be talking about getting to know Jesus. That's the greatest thing in the world, right? To know Jesus personally. And, and I'll tell you what I mean about that. But these words came up into my spirit, and I was actually looking over the sermon, and I, and I saw these words that we had. But I just want to put this out there for, your, um, for you to think about. And it goes like this. Watch your thoughts. They become words. Watch your words. They become actions. Watch your actions. They become habits. Watch your habits. They become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Amen? So it always starts with, with the words or the thoughts, usually. No wonder Jesus said, he said, take no thought saying. And so when you get thoughts, it's not that you're a bad person, no matter what type of thought you get. It means you live in a fallen world. Amen? And so there's all kinds of thoughts and things that come into our mind. But, but when these thoughts come, you have a decision. You can either speak these thoughts or act on them if they're negative, or you can say, you know what? I'm not taking that thought. I'm not going to accept that, and I'm going to think on the good things like, like the Bible tells us to do. You can have control over your mind, right? And so um, these are the words that came up into my spirit the other day. It was like, gracious Heavenly Father, I believe in you. I believe that a life of honoring you is a life that is worth living and has eternal unmatched worth. So that's what I choose, a life that honors you. Amen? I wish that all people, especially believers, would understand that it's a privilege to be in the kingdom of God. Amen. Well, you have to, we have to understand that, that God chose us before the foundation of the world. He, he doesn't want anyone to perish, but he chose you. He pursued you through his son, and you said yes, right? You didn't have to talk him into you getting saved. He already made the way for you to be born again and to spend eternity with him. Imagine that. He's not going to get tired of you and kick you out of the house after about a week. He wants to live with you in eternity. He loves everybody. That's the good news, right? And so knowing Jesus is more fulfilling than any experience that you could have in this world. It's more fulfilling than anything that anybody could ever do. Everything else is just a substitute or just a, uh, a, a trick of the devil to try to give you some kind of fulfillment that you'll never have. Any, any life outside of living for Jesus is a dead-end road. The only question is, is how far down that dead-end road are, are they going to go before they reach their senses and say, you know what, I think I'm going to live for Jesus now. I think I'm going to get to know the one who died for you, for me. Isn't it, isn't it a good thing to know the one who died for you? Look at uh, Matthew 11. So we're just going to get into getting to know Jesus. He's a real God, right? Amen. He, he, he is a person. He became a person also, right? He was God veiled in the flesh. Why did Jesus come and, and become one of us? Because we needed a substitute. We needed someone to take, to take our place on the cross because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And that's why Jesus came to wipe our sins away, to cleanse us. And now all we have to do is just uh, say yes to him and the Lordship, and we're in the family of God. It's not going to be a smooth ride the whole way through. If you find a smooth ride, let me know how you did it, because mine hasn't been smooth. You'll be up and down all over the place. You'll be full of challenges because you live in a planet with the curse on it. But I tell you what, if you realize that this race, this life that you live, this, if you compare it to a race, it's not a, uh, a sprint. It's a marathon. Amen? It's every day living for your Savior. Every day getting into the things of God and growing up spiritually. You know, it, it, and sometimes it's, it's the harder life on the flesh because the flesh likes to do what the flesh wants to do. 
Well, the flesh likes to take the path of least resistance. Or am I the only one? And so we learn to resist that flesh and to press into the spirit. And so if, if you live by the way of the world and just go with the world, it's like running downhill. You know, when you run downhill, it's easy. But when you get to the bottom of the hill, there's not much of a view. And there's not much of a sense of accomplishment. But when you run up the hill, it's a lot harder. But when you get to the top of the hill, the view's great. And the sense of accomplishment is great. And you can see so much better, so much clearer. But you have to believe that a life lived for God is worth living. I believe that with all of my heart. I know that anything that this world does, anything done in the world will be burned up in the, in the end. It will mean nothing. It's a big nothingness. But every day or every single thing or every single heartfelt gesture that you do for the kingdom of God, it will live on in eternity. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Look at 11, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. <clears throat> Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden or overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. Now, I believe this is the Amplified Bible because it's got an extended version. When he says that I will cause you to rest, it means I will ease and relieve and refresh your soul. That's a good deal, isn't it? Come unto him and he'll give you a refreshing of your soul. That takes out the torment. That takes out the sadness. That takes out the depression and the despair because, because you came to Jesus. And then he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle, meek, and lowly in heart. And you will find rest or relief and ease and refreshment and recreation and blessed quiet for your souls. I'll take that. Amen. And then he says in verse 30, for my yoke is wholesome, which is useful, good, not harsh, hard, sharp, or pressing, but comfortable, gracious, and pleasant. And my burden is light and easy to, to be born. That's the life that's living for Jesus, if you do it right. But you notice the first thing that Jesus said here? He said, come unto me. That's who you're coming to. He didn't say come into religion or come into rules without a relationship, with, which equals rebellion. He's literally saying, if you're weary and heavy laden, come to me. Right? Let me be your Lord. Let me be your Savior. Let me be your source of inspiration. Let your faith be based in me. A lot of people forget that, that we come to, it's Jesus who we come to, right? And then he says, learn of me or get to know me. So when you first come to Jesus and you first get born again, you, do, you know who Jesus is. You know what he's done. And so you respond to that, but you don't know him. You don't know him. You don't have a relationship or, or an experience with him. So the first step is coming, and then once you come, he says, learn of me. Spend time with me. Let you show me who I am. Let my love and forgiveness and the spirit that, that, uh, of God, let it get in you and take you into a place of peace, in a place of knowing him. That's a good deal, isn't it? We have to realize we often focus on a God that's so powerful, and he is powerful. He's all-knowing, all omnipresent, and, and and all powerful, but don't forget about the, the, the personal side. This God that created the heavens and the earth, and there's billions and billions of people on this planet, He is personal to you. He knows your name, Amen. He knows everything about you. When you came out of your mother's womb, you came out as one of a kind, a one of a kind person. No one else has ever been like you, and no one else will ever be like you. God proved it to you when He gave you your own fingerprint. That's why I don't get in trouble, because they'll find you if they take your fingerprint, right? He gave you your, your own DNA. I mean, you could, there could be people in, uh, um, in the earth that look like you, but they ain't you. There could be people that have your name, but they ain't you. There's only one you. I remember when I went to Raymond my first year, there was another John Pogue out there in Tulsa, and he was an accountant. And I kept getting people call, calling my apartment asking me to do their taxes. And I said, you don't want me to do your taxes. 
I'm an old tree trimmer from Pennsylvania and I'm going to Bible school. Taxes aren't in my, in my background. But you know, there's similarities, but you are unique, special, one of a kind. God is so personal. He's like, look, I don't want you just to know of me. I just don't want you to put you in a religious state where you just do things without thinking about it and rules without a relationship equals rebellion. He said, I want you to know me. You know, in Jeremiah 31, when God said, they will all know me, from, from the least to the greatest, from, from, the, um, from, the, uh, from the most important to the least important, important the, the young and the old, he said this, he said, they'll all know me. And when, in the new covenant he's talking about, when I, when I soften their heart to put my spirit in them. That word know, is the, it, there's two words for the word know when he says they'll all know me. The first word is, um, is what it isn't, what it isn't is this, that you know someone or you're acquainted with them. You get together once in a while and you might have tea. That's not the no he's talking about. The no he's talking about is an intimate, personal relationship, like a husband and wife type relationship. An intimate a trust and, and, and just closeness. Do you know Jesus like that? You know, you can, he knows you like that because he died for you. But when we get it through our heads sometimes that, hey, look, stop chasing the world and the things of the world and spend time with Jesus and to trust him and get in his word and prayer, then we're going to be at ease and we're going to be at, uh, have a refreshing on our lives. There was a minister uh, one day, he tells a story that he had a dream or a vision. I think it was a dream. And in this dream, there was three men in, in a room and they were praying. And then all of a sudden, Jesus came in the room. And the first person he spent a lot of time with, he was put, he put his arm around him, he was comforting him a lot. And then after a while, he went to the second man, and he did the same thing, but maybe about half as long. And then when it came to the third man, all Jesus did was smiled and waved and walked out the door. And so this guy, he wakes up from his dream, and he says, why didn't you go to the third guy? He says, that guy, I'm with him all the time. We're together all the time. I know him and he knows me. It was the other two that, that are, are missing the boat in that area. I want to be that person. I want to be um, the, the Peter, James, and, and John disciples that always went further with Jesus. They were the inner circle. They went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were with him when he raised Jairus, his daughter, from the dead. They went further with him in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was crucified. I want to be in that circle. Amen. Because Jesus is worth it. He's absolutely worth it. So what do we do to get to know Jesus on this personal level? First of all, make a commitment in your heart. You know, when Jesus said, come to me, who are you coming to? Uh, God? The Lord of Lords? The King of Glory? You're coming to, to, to God. You're coming to a king. You're coming to the one that created everything. The Bible says everything was created by him and for him, and in him they consist. You're coming to that God being. Amen. Amen? And so you honor him, and you respect him. Jesus said in the word, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Amen? You have to trust him. You have to trust what his word says. And when you do, he'll start to take take you places that you never thought you could go, but then you will actually know him. You'll know him. Spiritually speaking, you'll know him. You'll be intimate with him. You'll, you'll know his voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. You'll walk in the footsteps of Jesus. You'll be a loving person because, because if you know Jesus, you're going to walk in love. I know a lot of Christians, not a lot, but too many, that they, that they say they're born again and they've been at it a while. They're even tongue talkers. But they do things that have no love in it. And they, don't, and they justify it. It's witchcraft is what it is. And, 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 and I think to myself, the Bible says you can know them by their fruit. And if you're treating people like that, you might claim Jesus as your Lord, but you don't know him, know him. Because if you knew him, and you let him become who you are, 
You wouldn't dare treat people with disrespect and hatred. People created in the image of God. They don't even love God because God said, how can you say you love me if you don't love the people created in my image? The love walk is important, isn't it? We, we don't want to be in that number, do we? When, when, when pressed on all sides, just choose love. You know how you can get to know Jesus? Walk in his footsteps. Walk in his footsteps. Do the things that he did. Some things he can't show you until you put yourself out there and, and let him show you and, and give you the experience of what it's like to honor him. So we get to know Jesus by spending time in the word. Well, that's a wonderful way. I, I say to people all the time, uh, if you're looking for a place to read in the Bible, honestly, go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Go to the Gospels and read about the life and times in the ministry of Jesus. Read about how he healed the most um, outcast people that there were. When you read in there, you're going to read about a man by the name of Zacchaeus who was the tax collector, the most hated person in, 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 in the region. And Jesus called him down out of a tree and said, I'm going to your house today when everybody else rejected him. You're going to read about the woman with the issue of blood that spent all her money on the doctors and nobody could make her better. And she touched the hem of his garment and she said, she said, I felt the virtue. I'm healed. You're going to read about blind Bartimaeus along the road crying out for Jesus to heal him while everybody's kicking dust in his face. You're going to read about the woman that went into the temple, that Jesus went into the synagogue and she was bowed over for 18 years and he healed her on the spot. Amen. You're going to read about a loving, kind Savior that healed the, that, that cast the devils out of the madman of Gadara. Remember him? He, he, he was so wild that they chained him to the tombs and he, he broke free. And he was a naked, crazy, demon possessed man. And when he saw Jesus getting off the boat, he ran and, and he bowed to the feet of Jesus. And Jesus said, What's your name? Talking to the demons. And he said, Our name is Legion, for we are many. Thousands of demons in him. And what did they do? Bowed to the feet of Jesus, the one who asked you to come to him and get to know him. Maybe if you knew him, you wouldn't be afraid of the, of the dark, or be afraid of the evil. You would cast the evil out because you know him. Andrew Walmack, really good teacher, he said he spent a whole year all he read in the Bible was the, was the healing works of Jesus. That's all he read for a whole year. He just memorized it and meditated on it and just got it deep down into his spirit. And uh, him and his wife were going out of town on vacation, and he got a call that his youngest son just died in a car accident. And he said, okay, don't let anybody touch the body till I get there. Took him like an hour or so to get back. He went right in there, laid hands on his son, and rose him from the dead. And he knew what he said. It was easy because I've been reading for a year about the miracles of Jesus, and it was just second nature. I didn't even think about it. Thank God for the gospel. Thank God for the word. I think sometimes in our culture we take the word for granted because I, I probably have 50 Bibles. I'm not saying I take it for granted, but I'm saying the Bibles are everywhere. But over in places like China, they don't have much word. They have to hide it. I saw this video on Facebook where this, they had a shipment of Bibles come into this uh, Christian place in China. Those people grabbed those Bibles and they were crying and holding on to them and just so full of joy that they had their own Bible. We ought to have that love and respect for God's word. Amen. Amen. Because God's word should be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides the spirit and the, and, and the soul, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It is powerful. It gets right into the, to the reality of who you are in Christ. And so we spend time in the word, in prayer. You know, prayer is a discipline that you have to develop. When you pray, I think when, if, you have, if you don't have a healthy prayer life, you have to you just work on it because your flesh doesn't like to pray. Amen. At least my flesh did. Maybe you guys are different. 
Maybe you wake up in the morning and your flesh says, skip the bowl of cereal, go straight to prayer. <laughs> but when you pray, look at the clock and see what time it is. Like right now it's 7.50. Because your mind will convince you that you've been in prayer for a half hour. And you're getting tired. And if you look at the clock, no, it's only been three minutes. You got to control your flesh. And you got to get into prayer. And you just got to press into the spiritual thing. Some people only scratch the surface. No, God wants you to really, really talk to him. And it's not always about asking him for things. It's about praising him and worshiping him and thanking him for all that he's done for you. It wouldn't hurt Christians to just start the day and say, God, thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you took those nails in your hands and those nails in your feet. They put a crown of thorns on your head. They stuck a spear in your side. You died the death of a sinner, even though you never sinned. You did that for me. And I'm going to live for you. You died for me. I'm going to live for you. You died that I might live. That's a good prayer, isn't it? If more people left the house like that in the morning, there'd be a lot less road rage. I'm not going to get in road rage. I was on that the other night, but... A lot less uh, arguments, right? There would just be a, 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 a friendliness because you just came out of the presence of God. Do you know when you come out of the presence of God, there's oftentimes a glow on you? People can tell. People can tell when someone's been in the presence of God that you just look different, and you sound different, and you act different because you've been in touch with the Savior of the world. You've been in communication. Leslie and I were out to eat, I think it was like uh, way back on our honeymoon or something. We had a, a waiter, a guy, and I told, I told Leslie, I said, I know he's a Christian. I can just see it on him. Just, I could just tell. And later we, I, we ended up saying something to him, and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian. And you could just tell. Amen. Don't you want to be the person that people can just tell? They can just tell that you know Jesus. And you spent time in his presence. Isn't the greatest thing about being a Christian is that you get to spend time with Jesus? You get to spend time in prayer? It's the greatest. And so you get the word and you got prayer. And then you got walking in his footsteps of love and sacrifice. And then um, also be aware of the presence and the guidance of the Holy Spirit that's in you. That's your guide and that's your source. That's your comforter, your counselor. Uh, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will bear witness of him. He'll teach you about Jesus and all that Jesus has said. A lot of Christians, they, Jesus said he'll send you the Holy Spirit. And he'll be your comforter, but they're not aware of his presence. They're not aware. They're just um, too natural-minded. And so they miss out on that great gift of the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad for the Holy Spirit? I'll show you that. Look at John... Um, 16, verse 12. Jesus is, um, you know, getting ready to go on the cross, and he, sends, he, he um, says this to his disciples. This is the uh, New King James Version. But if he's speaking it to the disciples, he's speaking it to us, too. I mean, do you believe that Jesus, do you think he's still in the tomb? Do you think he's, uh, where do you think he's at? Right hand of the Father. He's your high priest, which means he's your go-between between you and the Heavenly Father, who, by the way, it was God's plan that salvation would come to you because he wants many sons and daughters in, in his kingdom. He has room for everybody. And so he's up there at the right hand of the Father, but then he lives in you through his spirit and through his word. The Bible says that if if you were joined to Christ, you're one spirit with him. We're connected. And we're all connected together too because we're all the body of Christ. We're all individual members, but we make up the body of Christ and Jesus is the head. What's the head mean? He's the authority. Amen? I mean, we are so close. When, when Saul, before he got converted to Paul, was on the road to Damascus, he was going out and persecuting the church, was he not? And he saw a great light, and he fell off his donkey, and he, and he couldn't see. 
and, and he heard a voice. Whose voice did he hear? Jesus. And what did Jesus say? He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So if you persecute the body of Christ, the church, you're persecuting Jesus. Because we are one with him. Amen. And we are one with the Father through our oneness with the Son. That's why it's never a good thing to persecute the church. So John um, 16, 12, Jesus said to the disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So he wanted to say a lot more, did he not? But he couldn't, they could what do you, what's it mean that he couldn't bear it? They, they're not going to understand it. What were they missing? The Holy Spirit. So Jesus is literally saying, I've walked with you three and a half years, and I'm about ready to go. And after I go, you're going to know more than you know now. Amen. <laughs> you're going to know more than you know now. Because I'm going to put my spirit in you. And he will teach you all things. Right? I'm sure they thought he was crazy when he was saying that. Because he told him, he, at one time he said, it's better for you if I go. And they're probably like, are you kidding me? We just walked beside you for three and a half years. You raised the dead. You healed, healed leprosy, made the lame walk, healed, cured the blind eyes. You, 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 you put the Pharisees in their place. You walked this fearless life, and we're, we're living like kings following your power. How is how's it going to be better if you're not here? I'll tell you how it's better. Instead of Jesus walking beside them, he'd be in them. Amen? That's how you can know. You can't know God unless he's in you. You can't know him in the natural, can you? With your natural mind and your, you're like you know a person. You've got to know him by the spirit because he is spirit. That's why Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. This is available to everyone in this room tonight. If you want this type of relationship with the Lord, all you've got to do is commit to it. And say to the Father and say to the Son every morning, you are worth living for. Mm -hmm. Amen? Because when it's all said and done, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. He's the one we're standing for. Not any president. Not any politician. Not any um, woke person out there, whatever they are. Not any of them. We're going to stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And guess what? All them people that don't bow their knee to Jesus right now, they're going to bow their knee. Everyone will bow to Jesus. Amen. Everyone. He's um, kind of a big deal. No, I'm just kidding. He's a real big deal. <laughs> I mean, come on. We got to, like, snap out of it a little bit. We, we, don't, we don't want... Um, I heard this one saying... It says some churches are, are like a daycare center just for baby Christians. I don't want to be that kind of place. And other places are churches that raise up spiritually sound and spiritually strong believers who know who they are in Christ. And when adversity faces them, they don't run in fear. They stand in the face of darkness and face of death sometimes in the face of all, that's, all the evil that's in the world. And they say in the name of Jesus, get behind me, Satan. That's the kind of church that Jesus is coming back for. A triumphant church, a victorious church. You have not been given a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Did Jesus say when he rose from the dead, all power in heaven and, and, and earth has been given unto me? What did he say to do with that power? Go write a book about it? He said, go ye therefore. Kenneth Hagin used to say, when you see the word therefore, find out what it's there for. The therefore is because he said, I'm the risen Savior. What haven't I done? I died the death of a sinner so that you could be set free. I, I, I conquered death, hell, and the grave. And now I'm the risen Savior. And my name is above all names. Take my name and go do something with it. That's some power, isn't it? In verse 13, he says, however, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. Look at this, verse 14. 
he will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. He's going to tell you everything that Jesus is and everything that he wants you to know and everything that you are to be in Christ. And he's going to lead you in the spirit of truth, which is the word of God. As you read the word of God, it's the spirit of truth and the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what you need to know. But you got to get in the right kind of church. You got to know God's intent for you. If you get in the wrong kind of church that preaches bad doctrine, you're going to be cut off at the, at the, at the beginning you got to go to a church, which you, which you do, that believes in the power of, of, of Jesus Christ. Amen. you got to go to a church that believes in, in the power of the Holy Ghost. you got to go to a church that you believe that healing is for today. Amen. And not only is it for today, 2,000 years ago, Jesus provided it for you. Amen. It's in your redemptive rights. And so when you pray and you believe, you're not asking or believing for something that doesn't belong to you. You're believing for something that's already been done. It's yours. That's a different type of prayer, right? It's not a prayer. Oh, God, please, if it might be your will, oh, God, please. And God, if you do this for me, I'll, I'll never eat Fruit Loops again or whatever. Oh, God, making these deals with him and, you know, oh, God, I'll, I'll, I'll be nice to my wife. I promise. Just give this to me. They're not prayers. They're just nothingness. God can't be manipulated. I'll tell you this. Everything that he's ever done for you, he did it in Christ. Amen. Now, your responsibility is to respond to his gift by, by faith. And you've got you to walk it out. You've got to talk it out. You've got to believe it every second. You've got to be not moved by what you see or by what you feel, but you, you're moved by what the word of God says. Amen? But the Holy Spirit, he said, he'll glorify me. And he'll take of what is mine and declare it to you. No wonder Jesus said, he said, I'm not going to tell it to you right now because you guys aren't going to understand it. You guys are still trying to call fire down out of heaven and, and kill the Samaritans. You guys are still fighting. Who's going to be my right hand and my left side? You guys are still fighting, thinking that I came to restore Israel right now and conquer the Romans. You guys are all messed up. I took you as far as I could take you, but I'm going to take you even further when I put my spirit in you. Amen? You check it in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell. Those guys became brave. Those guys went out onto the street. Peter preached the message. And he said, oh, you know the guy you just killed? You know, the guy, the guy you just threw rocks at and spit on and pulled his beard and put him on the cross? Uh, that was Christ, the Lord. That was the Savior of the world. And his words had power. Because the Bible says it cut them right into their heart. And they're like, what should we do? He says, repent, and be baptized, and be saved. 3,000. 3,000 people in the same city that just put Jesus on the cross, 3,000 of them came in, and it wasn't, it wasn't Jesus standing there physically. It was Jesus in Peter. He had the Holy Ghost. Because Jesus said in, in Acts 1.8, he says, wait for the Holy Spirit because you'll be endued with power when he comes. What kind of power would, would God give you? Uh, supernatural power? That when you speak, you speak words of life that cuts through the darkness. That's a good word, isn't it? Amen. I want to show you here. Um, look over at Matthew 14, 22. I, I want to read about the time that, uh, that Peter walked on the water. Because you can get a lot out of this, this uh, account in the Scripture. All I, all I got to say is there was how many in the boat? Twelve? Twelve or so disciples, right? Only one of them got out. Peter got out. So do you want to be the one that stays in the boat and just in fear or in worry? Or do you be the one that says, you know what? Because when Jesus told him to come, he came. He said, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come. Jesus said, well, it was him. 
So he said, come. Guess what? He's already told you to come unto him. He's already told you to learn of him and, and, and to get the refreshing for your soul. Does the devil haunt you about your past or things that you've done in the past? If, 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 if he does, you're letting the thief steal your joy. Because I want to tell you something. You have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Those sins are gone, washed, whiter than snow. That's not even who you are. You're a born-again child of God. Those sins don't exist anywhere but in your mind. Everywhere else, it's been eliminated. So you've got to renew your mind to the fact of who you are. You're so clean and so pure that the Holy Spirit lives in you. Don't let the devil beat you up on that stuff. Why would you want to listen to a, a liar? Not just any liar. The father of lies. Right? Come on now. You got you to gotta rise up. I know I'm speaking to someone here tonight. You got to rise up and say enough is enough. Stop reminding me of my past, devil. Get behind me, Satan. Every time you bring that thought into my head, devil, I'm going out and telling three people about Jesus. Just for the annoyance that you give me. But you know what will help, that, that help you in that? If you just knew Jesus a little bit better. Amen. If you just spent a little more time. I'm not just talking about throwing prayers up. I'm talking about Jesus, it's me and you. Yeah. I know I'm talking to you, the Savior of my life. I know I can trust you with everything because you died for me. Even when I was lost in sin, you still loved me and died for me anyway. That's the kind of relationship we need to have, right? People will let you down because they're human beings. God will never let you down. So look at Matthew 14, 22. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. He just fed like 30,000 people, by the way, with nothing. And so, and look at verse 23. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray and night fell while he was there alone. Look at that. Jesus went up by himself and prayed all night long. If he prayed, how much more should we pray? Like I said, he just fed like 30,000 people because they didn't count the women and children. He just fed all those people, did this tremendous miracle. You would have thought, he said, well, I kicked my feet up now because I, I did a great thing. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get some rest in, in my flesh. No, he went right back into the presence of the Father. And you know what happens when you spend all, all night in prayer? You might walk on water too, because that's what he did. You have to get after it. There are some types of prayers where you know that the devil's infiltrating your family. You know he's trying to cause harm. you got to pray in the Spirit, and you got to go out there in spiritual warfare, and don't let up until you feel that release. I said the other day, my son Cole um, sent me a message one day or called me and said that he didn't believe in God anymore. This was like 10 years ago. And that's not a good thing for a dad to hear. It's that, that internet stuff. There's a lot of bad stuff out there. It twists people's minds. And so I was at the church when I took the call. And I'm like, hmm. At first, it, it really, really hurt me. And then I thought, hmm, I know the Bible says if I raise my children up in the way of the Lord, when they get old, they'll not depart. It doesn't mean that they're going to be perfect, but it means that we're going to put it in them. It's going to be in there. And they're going to know where home base is. And so he's under some kind of physical or spiritual attack of the devil. So I didn't go home and cry to my wife. I didn't get on the phone and cry to three people. I didn't call the 700 Club and ask them for prayer. Well, that's okay. I prayed, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and I prayed in the Spirit, and I marched around these chairs, just praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, praying in the Spirit, till I felt that release, and then I left my words go, and I said some powerful stuff in the name of Jesus. 
couple days later, he, he called me and said, he said, I, I believe in Jesus. I said, well, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it that fast, but I'll take it. And now he has a ministry where he, he leads many people in India to the Lord. Many people. He understands their religion. He understands their, he can get into their, their ways of thinking. And he, all, he always points them to Jesus Christ. That's a special gift. Because there's, how many people in India are there? Amen. Sometimes we think, well, everybody has to come in the way we know. No, they don't. They come in the way that God knows that they need to come. Amen. And some people are so thinkers. They're just thinkers. They're just so, they got to logic everything. And you got to have some people to know exactly what they're talking about, how they're thinking, and lead them to Christ. And he does that. And so, yeah, Jesus prayed all night long. Verse 24, meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting a heavy waves. They had this episode on The Chosen. Anybody ever see The Chosen? I think it's season three. And so, about three o'clock in the morning, so that's how long Jesus prayed. Man, sometimes if we get 15 minutes in, we think we're doing good. We think we're spiritual giants. I got 15 minutes in. Maybe I'll try for 20 the next time. Then 25. Then 30. Amen? You can't outgive God. I know a woman that she, she had a family. She was very, very, very busy. And she said, there's just not enough time in the day. She said, I just can't do everything I'm supposed to do. And my spiritual life is struggling. And the Lord spoke to her. Now, he spoke to her. Now, I'm not saying he's going to tell you the same thing, but I'm just giving you an example of what he told her. He said, you give me the first hour of the day, and I'll take care of the rest. So she had to get up a little earlier. She gave him the first hour of the day praying, listening to music, worshiping God, reading the word, just spend it in the time in the spirit. She said, from that day, that time forward, there was more time in the day for her that she knew what to do with. I said, God redeemed the time. She used to be all over the place, and now she just said, I have time to just sit there and do some more reading. Only God can do that. But she made a commitment to him. If he's God, let him be God of your life. Right? That's what I did. Sitting on my kitchen floor. Wolf Avenue, single parent, four children. Felt like the world punched me in the gut and left me, left me out to dry, because they did. And I called out to my God. I said, God, I'm ready for you now, 30, 30 some years old. And I said, I, whatever you, I, I'm following you. I'm never turning back, ever. When I prayed that prayer, guess who heard me? God heard me. And he came right into my life. I felt him come in and restore me then I went on the journey with him and he gave me two things to do you're not even gonna need a pencil to write this one down two things he told me to do you might think it was like really like a uh, um, hard and and you have to you have to uh, interpret it when God's in it it's easy if someone tells me, hey, I heard from God, and I say, what is it? And they tell me something easy to understand and has a good meaning. I say, yeah, you heard from God. But when they tell me things, I have no idea what they're talking about. And they're talking about Revelations and Ezekiel and this and that and all this. And I'm like, I don't know if that's God. Right? Simplistic truths that have deep meanings that keep resonating. He said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to go to church. I want you to go Sunday and Wednesday because you're missing too much church. And it was true. I missed a lot of church. Because back then, we didn't have all these children programs. The, the kids were out with us. And I had four small children. And they didn't like to sit still. Sometimes I, I look at these parents that have these little kids, and they're sitting there perfectly still. I'm thinking, how do they do that? I hope they're not drugging them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, some kids are just more like that, right? My kids were active. And Chloe, the youngest one, she, she was something else. 
one time we, we took her into a, a shoe store to get her shoes. And one thing about Chloe, if she liked something, she wasn't going to let go of it. So we tried this shoe on that she really loved, but the only thing is it was two sizes too small. And I said, look, Chloe, I can see your toes right there. She says, no, they fit. It fits. And this, it was a big to-do. And, it was just, and she, we ended up knocking over this row of shoes because it was just like I was embarrassed. I probably tur- turned redder than, than what, a fire engine or whatever because I was easily embarrassed. I just grabbed her by the hand and said, come on, we're leaving. We didn't even stop and apologize. We just took off. <laughs> but anyway, but, but it was a handful. And the Lord, he wasn't too concerned about that. He said, no, I need you there. And you know what? Nobody minded the children. It was me. It was me who thought everybody was looking at me. I had that problem my whole life. Everybody's looking at me. Nobody cares. Nobody's looking. Anyway, <laughs> and, so, and, and so I started going to church. And man, it, it, I came back here. That's why as long as the Lord will have me here, I, I'll, I'll, I'll d- devote my whole life to this ministry because it was this ministry that was here for me when God sent me home. They, they, there was people that were here when I wasn't here and went through the battles and, and had the battle wounds and kept these doors open and fought off the false prophets and the wickedness of the world and maintained the integrity of the word of God. And so now it's my turn to return to favor. And so I came and, and uh, I just started, um, I actually told the Lord, I said, I'll do you one better. I'll go Sunday nights too. I was ready. See, sometimes you guys got to be ready. And um, they needed help in the, uh, I think it was like the five to six-year-olds. And I think, I got kids, I'll do it. When I was in the Army, they told me never volunteer for anything, but that was the Army. <laughs> so, you know, I'll do it. So we went right back in that social room, and all I can say is nobody got hurt. I got the word in them. We played a few games, and they know I loved them. But then after a while, Sister uh, Debbie Weaver said, I'll step up and take that. And her first time she came out with the class, she had crafts. I thought, crafts? I never thought of that. I'm not a crafty person. (laughs) I could maybe glue some popsicle sticks together and make it like a, I don't know. But man, they had these beautiful crafts. So I'm thinking, okay, she's more called. She's anointed for that. And then they needed help in the teenagers. I'll do it. That's a different world in there. Right over in that classroom. I was in there with them. There was about, maybe about 10. And they were just talking. And I'm trying to get their attention. I don't like to talk loud. And, and um, they're passing notes under the table. And, like, I can't see him. And the Lord said, just stop. He spoke to me. You want to know how you get to know Jesus? Just walk in his footsteps. He he spoke to me, and he said, just stop. and Wait till they stop, and then say this to them. And so it took them about maybe 30 seconds. They realized that nobody was saying anything, and I was just sitting there. And they stopped, and and I said, look, you have all week to do whatever you want to do. We got 45 minutes to an hour in here that belongs to the Lord. We ought to give the Lord his time. From that time forward, they were good as could be. Amen. And so I started that journey not knowing, not expecting that one day I would be the pastor here. Never even crossed my mind. I just wanted to do something for the one who died for me. I wanted to stop running from the very things that I needed to help fulfill me and make me feel, um, feel satisfied in my soul, you know? And then, you know, of course, when he called me to go to Raymond, that was a whole other story. But I could stand up here and tell you, I got out of the boat. I remember when we were going to Bogota, Colombia, all the participants had to um, speak and um, see Sister Sarah there. Welcome, Sister Sarah. Amen. It's been a while. What's that? She's from Bogota. How many know Sarah? This is a new crowd. Everybody know Sarah? Yeah, her, her dad, Pastor Jose, that's our favorite church down there we go to. And, um, and so we were going there, and, and Sister um, Denise stood up here. She was probably the most scared of all of them, am I right? But the Lord told her what to say. And he said two things to her that I remember to this day. And if I remember it, it's from the Lord. The first thing he told her before she left the house, he said, you're putting too much of yourself into it. 
just go out there, just, just give, them, give them the best you can do. Sometimes we can put too much of ourselves into it, right? And then he said, then Denise said, you know, there's good things outside the box, but you have to go out there and get them. Right. Nobody can bring them into you. There was good things outside of my little box that I had built around myself. And, and, and I wasn't going to experience these other things until I went out there trusting the Lord. And then as I did, he just started putting the pieces back together. And now I'm glad that he did. I'm glad that I'm here and doing what he called me to do. And so look at um, verse 25. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified in fear, and they cried out, It's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, Don't be afraid. He said, Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. And so in verse 29, Yes, come, Jesus said. So he said, if it's you, tell me to come. Well, it was him. So he said, come. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. Remember now, the wind and the waves and the storm. It was a terrible sight. He stepped out of the boat on the word of Jesus that said to come. Now, Jesus said, you come unto him, all you that weary and heavy laden. Come means keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. It's not come visit me for tea and then maybe some other time. You got to stay abiding in the presence of your Lord. And so he jumped out of that boat. As far as I know, there's only ever been two people that walked on water. Jesus and Peter, right? Look at verse 30. But when he saw the strong wind and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped and the disciples worshipped him. Worshipped him and said, you are really the son of God, they exclaimed. So Jesus wanted Peter to have the faith to continue walking on water. In fact, he said, why did you doubt? That tell, that's why Jesus said all things are possible to those that believe. Right. And so I compare Peter to this way. Peter got out of the boat. He came to Jesus, but on his way coming to Jesus, he took his eyes off of Jesus and he sank in the water, did he not? When he was coming to Jesus, he really, really didn't truly know him. He was coming to the word come, and he was coming to the one that he see do all the miracles. But, but he didn't really know him like he was going to know him when he got filled with the Spirit, did he? And so he came to Jesus, and when he began to sink, sink he, he cried out, and Jesus lifted him out. We've all been there, right? We're walking on the water of the world. We're walking above all the things that used to sink us. And now we get a little, we see the wind and the waves and we get, take our eyes off of Jesus and we begin to sink. So what's the answer? Get your eyes back on him. But when Jesus pulled him up out of the water, I believe Peter walked back to the boat with Jesus. So he literally walked on water twice. I don't believe Jesus picked him up like a big baby. and was like, right? He walked with Jesus. So there's a difference to, of walking to Jesus that, and walking with him. We got to walk with him. Yeah, you walked to him and you made it. You did good and you put, you put him as your Lord and Savior. But now he wants you to walk with him. And sometimes when you walk with Jesus, you got to walk through the fire. Well, go ahead. He'll be there with you. Sometimes you got to go into the lion's den. Well, go ahead. He, he'll, be the, he, he'll be there with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. People need to see a little bit more of Jesus in, in his followers so they can have a light to get out of the darkness. And so, as, as I said earlier, the other disciples, they stayed in the boat, stayed in the comfort zone. There was another account where the, the, they were in a storm, and, and remember Jesus was sleeping at the bottom of the boat, in the, and... and uh, he, he wasn't worried. He was calm as, it, calm as he could be. I found those people that have those deep personal relationships with Jesus, they don't worry about nothing. 
you know, because because they know that the presence of the Lord is with them. And, and so he got up and he, he rebuked the storm, right? Then what did he say? Oh, you have little faith. Why didn't you do that? We can do a lot more than what I believe that we think that we can. You can calm every storm. You can speak to every demon. You can speak to every sickness and disease that tries to bombard your life. And you can speak the power of the name Above all names, the name of Jesus. That's where your power comes from. The name of Jesus. Remember Paul, the story about Paul when he was casting out devils and the seven sons of Sceva thought they'd try it. And they weren't real followers. So they go into this demon-possessed house uh, and, and they got a whooping. And they said, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, come out. And they're like, well, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, but who are you? I think I would have took off fast. <laughs> they ran out of there naked. What kind of beating is that that you run out naked? Paul walked in there and said, in the name of Jesus, come out. And they came out. You can do that too. You can cast out devils. You can walk victoriously. You just got to know that you can and believe that you can. And you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's all I have. Would you rise, please? Let's pray. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all these precious souls that came, Lord. And now, Lord, I just pray that you go with them in peace and keep them safe in all that they do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.